And what makes me believe that is that there had to have been some ulterior motive here um, because Harvey Lynn was paid the grand total of $50 per episode to consult on this series. <laughs> really? Well, that's that's a lot. <laughs> I mean, that's a ridiculous sum of money, considering right. that some of these think tanks charge thousands of dollars for the same service. Sure, sure. Uh, for other clients. So when I heard about that one, I was like, okay, what's really going on here? Mm. Hmm. And with Gene Roddenberry having been rumored to be a high-level Freemason and involved in all that structure, um, you know, it kind of pushed me off more towards the conspiratorial um, thoughts. Um, one of the sad things about Star Trek is that it's also being used as a mind control device. Uh, how is that? Um, what happens is on several of the shows um, we have characters that are represented as being non-human and who aspire to being human. And by that I'm referring to the android Data right, right. from the next generation, Spock from the original series, and these two characters have been, you know, talking about the fact that they, you know, aspire to being human. And this has been written into these mind control scripts. Hmm. Uh, furthermore, some of the mind control structuring has mimicked the exact format of the onboard computers, which you can find diagrams for these very things inside the various technical manuals mm -hmm. that they sell for each show. Hmm, that's interesting. So, do you, and and how would this be applied to, or is it being applied? Do you think to someone who is watching? the show as, as a form of trigger, or, or how is this applied? Yes, it's being used as a trigger and also reinforcement of prior mind control uh, layering that had been done previously. And it's something that's very problematic and very troubling because the people that this happens to end up being like these super fans where literally they don't watch anything else except for Star Trek. Right. These are the people who spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to collect uh, various trinkets related to the shows. Hmm. Um. What about the background on, on, you know, you mentioned a little bit about Gene Roddenberry there. Um, is there anything that, that you've found uh, that seems to point to, you know, I guess why he wrote it to begin with the story? I mean, his, his I guess, a, a background in, in, in sci-fi overall or or a novelist or, or something similar. But uh, is there something about his background, do you think, that, that you know, he was chosen for, for this particular role, so to speak? Well, actually, his writing experience previous to Star Trek was primarily on police shows um, because he was uh, working in law enforcement before he became a screenwriter, a television screenwriter. And what happened is he wanted, so the story goes anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. he wanted to create a show that would be an archetypal representation of a 23rd century um, Western 
and he described it as wagon train to the stars. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. And if we go to the series Deep Space Nine, right. for example, right. um, we find that everything about that space station is like the Wild West town in the middle of nowhere right. wilderness. And and that is also, I mean, there's very clever and, and smart you know, an analogies in the Star Trek series. For, for one, of course, we could talk about the characters and, and the different, you know, persona, I guess, that they do represent. Uh, uh, Spock being the, you know, the one who's shut off his emotions and so forth, and uh, Kirk more, I guess, more altruistic and, and you know, the the hero in that sense and uh, you know they have all these different different type of characters in in the series um and, and much the same way as you just mentioned with the space station being out in space uh when man um, travels out or or potentially is or you know is going to travel out into space in that manner it actually is like a, a macrocosm of of what happened here on planet earth going over to the wild wild west as it were where there are no rules or laws, but they're going out, out into into the open, uh, pioneers, if you will, if if you hear what I'm saying, you know. Yes, in fact, in uh, among the first episodes of the first season of Deep Space Nine, the character of Doctor Bashir had mentioned that he could have worked at any uh, post in the Federation, but he chose this because it represented frontier medicine. Mm. Mm. So that particular phrase was used, and that harkens back once again to the Wild West. Right, right. The manifest destiny and so forth. Um, I I have a piece here that is written by, um, let's see here, written by Jeff Wells. Uh, the, the article is called The Color Out of Space, and he, he actually touched upon this a little bit with, with Rodenberry, and this is quite a len- lengthy piece here, a few paragraphs, but uh, I'm going to read and, and see if I can get a comment from you on, the, on this one, Kent. Um, let's see here. It's titled The Deep Space Nine. Um, the Council of Nine, uh, I should preface this by saying that uh, the Nine is... is also known as the Ennead of, of Egypt. This is in, within the paragraph here, but the, but the article touch upon a guy called Andrea Pucharic, and I can uh, add, a, add a wiki link to this interview so people that don't know who he is and so forth can uh, get a little bit of background on him. It's too lengthy to go into in this program, but uh, that's just what I want to mention to preface that. But I'm, I'm going to read this here. Um, the Council of Nine have been deliver- delivering curiously consistent messages through a succession of mediums to influential patrons with names like DuPont, Astor, and Bronfman since the early 1950s, and nearly always in the shadow of military intelligence. Until his death, death in 1995, Pucharic made his home in that shadow, researching shaman, uh, shamanic pharmacology and electronic mind control. Uh, initial contact was made during a sitting of Pucharic's CIA Cut out Roundtable Foundation on New Year's Eve 1952 at precisely 9 p.m. when the entities disclosed themselves through the transceivership of Dr. D. G. Vinod as the nine principal of or, or forces. Uh, in the early 1970s, Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry was a regular at the sessions of channeler Phyllis Schlemmer. I probably butcher that name, sorry for that, but. Um, <laughs> Phyllis Schlemmer, to whom the Nine had revealed themselves through the manifestation of a spirit guide called Tom. Schlemmer initially assumed Tom must be her grandfather Thomas, who died when she was a little child. In September 1974, Roddenberry asked Tom the question, To whom am I talking? Do you have a name? Tom's reply, through the entranced Schemler, as quoted by Picknett and Prince, as you know, I am the spokesman for the Nine, but I, I also have another position which I have uh, with you in the project. I will try to give you names so you can understand in what you work and who we are. I may not pronounce who I am in a manner which you would understand because of the problem in the being's uh, and brain, 
but it will ex- uh, it will explain so that the doctor Puharic uh, perhaps will understand. And I, Tom, um, but I am also oh I can't pronounce his name Hama- Hamarakis or something like that. I'm also Harenkur. Uh, I am also as Tomb, and uh, and I'm also known as Atum. Uh, the article continues to say it took 20 year, uh, 22 years and Jean Rodemary for the Nine to reveal themselves as the Nine, the Grand Ennead of ancient Egypt. Atum, Shu, Tefnut, Geb, Nut, Osiris, Isis, Set and Nephthys. Uh, their message amounts to we're back and now it's pers- personal. How much the Nine may have influenced Rodemary is unknown. His involvement began several years uh, after the original Star Trek series was cancelled, but a character named Vinod pops up in an episode of Deep Space Nine entitled Paradise. Anyway, that ends, ends that little uh, paragraph there, but it's pretty interesting if, if uh, Jeff Wells, who's writing this article, is correct that Gene Roddenberry was kind of in this environment and background and may give a hint to where some of the information might be coming from. Any comments on this segment here, Kent? Yeah, it's um, quite interesting that these um, type of facts never make it into the official biography of Gene Roddenberry. And they've been very careful about crafting a very specific story as to how all this got started. And this... um, Um, One particular book, which is called Star Trek Creator, which is the official biography of Gene Roddenberry, sanctioned by his um, family. And his wife did the preface for the book, even. Um, They were very careful to avoid all these types of issues. Um, I believe because it would tell too much of the real motivation. And when you were talking about the Council of Nine right. and the Ennead of uh, ancient Egypt, what came to my mind was the Great White Brotherhood. Right. So that still represents itself in our existence at this point in time. Do you think that's a, a benevolent force that is working, uh, you know, to uh, disseminate some of this information, or, or do you think it's it's just, you know, the, a manipulation to lead uh, uh, humankind astray? What do you think? Well, I would like to think that it's for the good. Um, but, you know, I have no evidence one way or the other. My personal feeling is is that they do seem to be benevolent. Mm. Because if you look at the, you know, um, organizational tenets of the Great White Brotherhood, they do talk about devoting... um, their energy to making the world a better place, right? so on and so forth. Right. Well, exactly. I mean, if we look at the at the overall, I mean, I myself am not personally against a, a future where, you know, humankind in that sense is, is, is united and uh, at least not at each other's throats. Okay, the Star Wars series obviously uh, touch upon the idea that there is a fighting going on with other races at that point in the universe, but uh, at least we've we've made some progress here on Earth. As long as that is not, you know, uh, on the uh, on the altar of you, if you will, on of of the freedom of of um, you know people living their own lives the way they want it, uh, will I guess we'll just have to see how that one you know, pans out. But at least uh, the the overarching idea. Uh, that we have reached some kind of agreement on this planet. That's a that's a pretty good uh, good idea to to me at least, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And not everything about Star Trek is negative.